There's a lot of interesting features in today's gospel. You could talk about the rich man. You can talk about Lazarus. But the thing that really kind of jumped to my imagination was this chasm. It says, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing. A strange image that nobody can cross. And as you look at that very short phrase, first of all, there's a mention of us. Abraham is talking as an us, him and Lazarus. And the man, the rich man, is alone on the other side. He's not included. He is outside. And he cannot bridge that gap in order to be part of the us. He will always be an himself. And then there's this chasm. And what is a chasm? It's a void, an emptiness. There's empty space. There's nothing there. And there's no substance to it. I remember a number of years ago, I went to the Grand Canyon and did some hiking in the Grand Canyon. And you can stand on the end, uh, on the side of it and look out and just see the beauty of this great chasm. But you also realize that it's dry, it's desolate, it's empty. And if you don't watch yourself, you could fall off the trail, which many people do every year when they hike the Grand Canyon, or come face to face with rattlesnakes. It's a pretty desolate and ugly place sometimes. And if you stand on one side of the canyon, you definitely cannot cross to the other side. And then the Gospel says this chasm is established in the passive voice. It doesn't say who put it there. Who established that gap, that chasm? Well, you could probably say that most of the fault find, finds itself with the rich man. He avoided Lazarus when Lazarus needed his help. He established it when he just left Lazarus on his own. He obviously knows who Lazarus is. He says his name a couple of times. But still, nonetheless, there is a chasm that cannot be crossed between Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man still treats Lazarus as a slave, as a servant. He says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to give me some water. Send Lazarus to go to my brothers. He's still treating him like he's, he's his slave or servant. And so we realize that the chasm that is established between the two of them cannot be crossed because of the closed-mindedness, even in death, of the man who is rich. This evening we remember that Jesus is able to bridge the gap in the chasm in his life. Remember how during his life he brought the poor and society together. Lepers were cured by him. Lepers were required to live outside of the city. And when he cured them, they were able to rejoin society one, one more time, bridging that gap. He also taught that, he taught the Pharisees and the Sadducees that of these poor people, these lame people, these Samaritans, all of the different people around, they make up the kingdom of God, and we are called to embrace that kingdom of God, no matter who is in it. And so when we look around our society today, we see many times that we're far away from that call of bridging that chasm between people. Economists tell us that the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer. The middle class is disappearing. Uh, Stephen Colbert the other night on his show said the last six months of gains in the stock market went to the richest 1% of Americans. Pretty interesting. And the chasm widens even further. More people are coming to our food pantry who never came before. Our numbers are way up there. And then there's increasing job loss among very qualified people. And the chasm widens even more. So we are called to be people who bridge the chasm, or at least bring to mind that there is a chasm in the first place. We are called to bring people together each and every day. We're called to be generous with our goods. We, in many ways, are rich and so are called to share with those who are less fortunate uh, than ourselves. We are called to tell the truth of what the economy does to us here in the United States. And many people, as a result of that, become very, very nervous. 
I remember Bishop Don Helder Camara in Brazil has this quote, I fed the poor and they called me a saint. I asked why they were poor and they called me a communist. There is a threat there. When we start talking about the economy, people get a little upset and worried. And when the church starts, starts to do it, people say, well, there's this whole separation of church and state. Well, remember that we are called to be a moral force. We're called to uh, diagnose the ills of our society. And just last week, uh, Pope Francis said the, was it, the might of a community is not judged by how wealthy they are, but how they treat the poor. Now that's in direct contradiction to Glenn Beck, who a few months ago said, if your priest or minister starts talking about social justice, find another church, which I thought was rather interesting. So there's justice that is 5,000 years of tradition in the Bible, and it's easier to avoid it and push it to the side than really talk about it. And what happens? The chasm widens even more. So as Catholic Christian people, what are we called to do? First of all, by our own generosity, we're called to bridge the gap, to make that chasm a little bit smaller. We're called to diminish the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the immigrant and the native, the Muslim, the Jew, and the Christian. We are always called to be people who bring others together, to welcome all, and to extend a hand to those who are in need. Through our own generosity and our own resources, we indeed can be people who close up that chasm, who bridge that gap, and form a true body of Christ. Mm -hmm.